Hey HK fans, James here with another Workbench Wednesday video. Uh, today I've got an MP5 SD that's in here in the shop. Um, good buddy of mine, uh, Steve, uh, two of us go way back to early time in the Marine Corps, and uh, he was having some issues with his SD, sent it in here for me to do um, a complete overhaul on it for him, and I thought, you know, that's a great opportunity to do a video. Uh, I've never done one on how to clean an MP5, and though, uh, you know, the, the level of maintenance that's going to be involved in getting this uh, cleaned up is actually going to require it to be completely disassembled all the way down to its, you know, individual components minus the stock um, itself. Um, anybody who's ever owned an MP5 SD will understand how dirty these things can get. Um, so that's a, a little bit more intensive than what I'm thinking about putting it together here for you today. Um, but a basic level... Um, you know, cleaning instructional video on the MP5 series, that I thought would be pretty helpful for you guys. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of videos out there for general weapons cleaning um, for you to view, and there might be even some on MP5s, um, but I'm pretty confident that you guys will appreciate the uh, tips, techniques, and procedures that I can present to you from my experience as an armorer um, and working on these guns for years now. Um, that will give you a little bit better perspective on how to properly uh, maintain your MP5. So, without further ado, why don't you grab yourself a nice tasty beverage, and follow me across the workbench, and we'll get started. Okay, let's get started here on the video. Um, the first thing we'll talk about, one to make sure you have, is a suitable um, place to work. Um, I'm sure that not everybody has a nice workstation like I do here, uh, but I do recall the days when, you know, it used to be putting newspapers out on a kitchen table um, to, uh, to work on my guns. And I'm sure that some of you guys like to just take an old towel and put it over the coffee table, sit down in the, in the living room while you're watching a football game on the weekend to clean your guns. Regardless, you, you want to have somewhere where you can lay everything out. Um, you've got it within, within arm's reach. Um, on my workstation, I really like to have these mats. This one here is obviously the Ransom Mega Mat. They make a couple of different sizes, um, but not only does it help me keep the workstation clean, um, but the little segmented sections here allow me to keep parts and tools um, organized and separated, and the, the ribs keep things from rolling off and onto the floor never to be found again. So good piece of gear. Uh, beyond that, um, because again, I'm OCD and I like to keep things even cleaner, um, I'll put, uh, shop cloth or uh, paper towels on top of that um, help me with the cleanup afterwards have it have some extra ones laying around uh, for use if you need them so that's the start again i recommend uh also to have rubber gloves there's different brands and types uh, the solvents all the stuff that's that's in your weapons you probably don't want to get that on your hands and into your mouth and on your face so wearing rubber gloves is easy to uh, help protect your hands as well especially if you do it as often as I do. Um, so having those available. And then as far as what you wanna have uh, tooling wise, um, you know, patches. Um, I like to have the lint-free uh, type. These actually come in a size that is about this big and I cut them all in half so I can get better use out of them. And I like this type of rectangular pattern for the way I do my cleaning. Um, I should probably have stock in q-tips uh, for how many i use i've got short ones and long ones and even these uh kind of pipe cleaner um, style uh, really help and you're going to need some kind of uh, cleaning kit now there's lots of them out there um, this is the one that i recommend if you can still find it through h and k or on hkparts.net um, it's a you know mobile travel type kit you open it up it's got you know the the uh breakdown style cleaning rod. It's got patches and, and, uh, and a rag, and then you've got your AP brush and your bore brush and a couple other tools here we'll discuss uh, later on in the video. Um, so you'll have to have something like that as well. Um, and then your solvent. Um, there's lots of different types. I've probably had experience with all of them over the years, um, but the one that I have found to be the most effective as a cleaner, lubricant, and protectant is uh, Slip 2000's uh, Extreme Weapons Lubricant. Um, highly recommend that. Really does an excellent job across the board for what I need uh, that product like that to do. Um, so that really sets me up for success. 
once you've got everything laid out and ready to go, uh, then you need to make sure that there's no ammunition you know, in the weapon or on the table, whether it's in the magazines, in the gun, laying around, you don't want any ammunition to be uh, associated with all that. So we'll start here with uh, one of my SP5s. Um, and the first thing I wanna do is obviously make sure it's clear. I'll do a vis visible and physical inspection of the chamber to make sure it's unloaded. I'll do the same here with Steve's MP5 SD so I don't forget about that. Okay, once they're clear, you wanna make sure you put your bolt forward. Um, you can remove the stock with the bolt back to the rear, but everything's under spring pressure. It'll be harder, and when you do, that, that bolt group's gonna to wanna to rock it out at you. So ease the spring tension on these things uh, before you take them apart. Then you're gonna remove your rear takedown pin, pull it out, set it off the side, and then you can remove the stock to the rear. Now, when you remove the stock on the weapon, I would recommend not holding it in the pistol grip and pulling it off that way, but instead grabbing it here around the magazine well and the front hand guard and pulling it back to this um, back this way. The A3 stocks are always really tight on these guns, which is the case on mine. And as you see, what will happen is when I release this, if I was holding on to um, the grip and holding up like that, it would fall completely off. It's not connected here and this would end up crashing down on the ground. So I've seen that happen lots of times when guys are out on the range and they take their weapon apart for one reason or another. If they hold on to the, the trigger group, when they pull that stock off, it's gonna come flying forward. And that's just the difference in the civilian, you know, commercial type weapons that use a, what we call a semi-auto shelf down here versus what you'll see with the actual real full auto MP5s like this one, you can see it's got another push pin here at the front. Um, and if I removed this rear takedown pin on the MP5 SD and pulled the stock off, instead, if I wasn't holding it like I suggested there, it was holding it here on the pistol grip instead, what you'll see is that the pistol grip will then swing down. And this is why they call these swing down lowers um, because they swing down on this uh, attachment point here. There's a different uh, push pin that you can then remove and that trigger group will come off on its own. So a little bit different in how these things, um, these work between the military law enforcement full auto variants and the commercial products as well, okay? Once you separate that off, you now have your stock group, you have your trigger group and you have your receiver group. And if you dump the receiver upside down, out will come your bolt group, okay? Some guys won't take off their handguard for uh, just a basic maintenance, they'll leave it on. I always recommend removing it. Um, you'd be surprised to see, depending on your environmental conditions that you operate within, how much gunk, dirt, and debris can get inside the handguard. But it also gives you the opportunity to inspect the barrel itself um, to make sure that if you had a squib brown, you might not have even noticed it, but you would be able to see a bulge in your barrel um, once you take the handguard off. So we can set that off to the side as well. And now I've got basically uh, my weapon broken down into those um, assembly groups. Okay, so let's start with the stock first. If you have an A3 telescoping stock or just the end cap unit um, that comes with the, the pistol sold or the weapon sold in pistol format, um, you will see inside that there is this kind of horizontally shaped H uh, buffer, this recoil buffer back here. When they're brand new, they're clear um, or somewhat semi-translucent polymer. Um, over time and use, uh, they'll start to turn more of like an amber um, or black color with all the carbon that gets on them. So the first thing I do, obviously, other than check the functionality of the stock and make sure there's no you know, significant dents, dings, or rust on it, is I'll check the condition of that um, recoil buffer. It should still be somewhat pliable um, if it is, is really, really hard or becomes brittle and you see parts of it chipping off and it no longer has this, you know, horizontal H pattern to it, then you're going to need to replace it. Um, obviously, that's part of the recoil buffering system of the weapon. Um, so it's good to have one of these, um, you know, spares in your toolkit if you need it and just to check on there. Obviously, if you shoot it a lot, there's going to be a lot of uh, carbon debris uh, in this area of the end cap. Um, that you'll want to clean out as well. And for the rest of that, it's just wiping it down with uh, with your solvent 
Um, get in there sometimes with Q-tips or compressed air to blow that stuff out uh, and wipe it down. If you have the, uh, the A2 solid stock, you will notice that there is no recoil buffer in there. There's just a metal plate. Obviously, it makes it much easier to clean. Uh, it doesn't require a recoil buffer because that A2 stock, the end cap actually sits further back and does not uh, make contact with the actual uh, uh, bolt group when it goes back to the rear. So a little fun fact there if you've never known that. Okay, so pretty simple to work, work on these, clean these, um, just check the buffer, wipe them down. Okay, so I'll set the trigger groups aside for now, receiver aside, and let's talk about the bolt group. Okay, the first thing I would say on, uh, on the bolt group when you get it out, is, and this really kind of goes to everything else, is resist the temptation to immediately go to your cleaning patches or your rag and spraying the solvent. I see that all the time. People immediately just douse everything with solvent, start cleaning, and what that will create if the gun's dirty is just this muddy mess all over the place. So the first thing you should do when you get your bolt group out, your stock out, the inside of your receiver, whatever, is just get a cloth and just wipe it down um, with the cloth, and you'll be amazed when it's dry how much carbon will come off the weapon just in using the cloth first. Um, and then once you've done that, and you get into some more aggressive things, then you can use the solvent. Uh, you will make much less of a mess. You'll use, end up using less solvent, less cleaning patches if you use just a simple rag in the first place. Obviously, this uh, SP5 is relatively clean. I only shot it um, to um, confirm zero on it at a, at a recent course, so it's not really that dirty, but you get the idea. Now, Different types of bolt groups, uh, new SP5s, they come with what is called the F bolt carrier. And the way you'll know this difference is when you go to grab the recoil spring assembly, it'll pull straight out of the back of the bolt carrier itself without any problem. Uh, the other models, the original MP5 style and the MP5 Action 3 uh, bolt groups, when I pull these out, you'll notice that the recoil spring assembly is captive. It stays inside the rear of the bolt carrier, okay? So if, it had, if it's this style, no problem, comes right out. If it's the earlier style, it's like this. You do not need to continue to pull and torque on this to remove it for normal maintenance. Um, if you want to remove it out of the back, you can, but there's no reason that you need to for just a normal cleaning. It's actually held in place by this polymer recoil um, not, I'm sorry, not recoil, polymer uh, bushing here on the back. There's another one here on the front. That's what's holding in place. You just got to torque it a little bit to get it out. But the more you do that, the more wear you put on the other end of that. Um, and if it fails, it cracks and it fails because this, uh, this whole assembly is riveted into position, uh, you basically have to replace the entire recoil spring assembly at the you know operator level. So save yourself the trouble. Don't pull this out um, for normal maintenance uh, and cleaning. But when you do have it out, if you want to clean it, the way I recommend it is, again, to wipe it down from the outside with a rag, and then you're just going to go vertical on it. And what I'll do is, is grasp the spring itself, and I can pull it down, and then I can come in with a patch that I can soak in with some solvent and wrap it around and clean the inside of the actual recoil spring. You can see kind of a rust color here with this. Um, no surprise there. So if I put some more um, solvent around it, compress it, go as far as I can down, wrapping that around, flip it over, go to the other side, bring that down. I could put some more on the outside of the actual springs themselves, get those as clean as possible, and then when I'm done, I can set that aside. If it's, if it's set in the system like this, you can do the same thing and run it this way. You flip it over the other side, just pull down on the bolt carrier itself, and that will allow you to get access to the rod. So again, you don't have to take that apart for that process, okay? So that is the recoil spring assembly. Now, if we go to uh, the bolt carrier um, with the bolt um, in position, you'll see it moves back and forth here. If you want to disassemble this, holding it in your right hand with the front of the bolt carrier facing off to your left, you're simply going to grasp the bolt and rotate it so that it's turning towards you. You'll get about a half a turn with this and then you'll hear a pop and that'll come off. So first the bolt, then the locking piece, and on the locking piece you'll find the uh, firing pin and the firing pin spring. And now you've got this separated into its uh, different groups 
And now you can go again with, with a, a dry cloth and just kind of wipe everything down. Get as much of the carbon off first before you move in to um, working with any solvents that are on there. Okay. So differences you'll see here. This is again the F bolt group that comes in the new SP5. If I've got an earlier model, same process, rotate it um, to the right, it's going to come off. Those pieces will come out. What you will notice when I take this apart now is I have a single coil uh, firing pin spring here, whereas the newer style is a braided coil. It's longer and it's multiple um, springs wound together. So this new braided style was designed to be more robust and strong. I have seen these single coils break over time, many, many tens of thousands of rounds fired. Um, these ones obviously will last much longer. So if you take your bolt group apart and you find that this thing is broken into two pieces, you need to replace it, I would recommend you replace it with the newer F-Style. Uh, it's cross-compatible with all those um, that you put together. Okay, so we'll set that aside. And now, um, where do I look for? On the shoulders here, the locking piece is where you're going to get the most of the carbon buildup and kind of in that little trough area there. So I'll wipe those down. You can run a Q-tip through the back of it as well. And then you're really going to spend the rest of your time focusing on the bolt. And the majority of the carbon buildup you're going to get on the bolt is obviously going to be on the bolt face on both the sides here on the extractor, under the extractor lip, and on the bolt face itself. Um, this little raised portion here, you're going to get a uh, buildup on this portion, and that's where it sits uh, in position here with the bolt carrier. So you can scrape that off. Love to have a dental pick if it's good enough for your dentist to scrape plaque off your teeth. It's great to work on, on your weapons too. So I can go into these areas and I can agitate all of this uh, carbon that's on there with the dental pick before I come in there with the solvent. Um, it'll break those things up. And sometimes this carbon is on here hard enough that just simply coming across it with a soft cloth is not going to be enough. The other place you'll notice a lot of carbon buildup is if you flip it upside down, you'll see the feed pawl right here. In between the feed pawl is this is deeper channel. Uh, you'll get buildup here and on either side of these walls. This is actually where the ejector lever on your trigger group goes up and down. Um, here on the back is where the back of the bolt carrier, this portion right here is what pops up in that channel and kicks the casing um, up and off the front of the, uh, the bolt face. So you'll get a lot of carbon buildup in that area as well. So coming in there with, uh, with some kind of scraper tool like a, like a dental pick can really break up that carbon. Once I've done all that, and, uh, and I think I've gotten the most of it off with, um, with a dry rag, then I can come in and actually apply some solvent um, to a patch, and I can come back through and run that over the weapon to try and get the rest of that gunk carbon buildup out of the bolt itself. Okay, I also like to use Q-tips, so put a little solvent on the Q-tip. I'll run it in through the back of the actual bolt itself, get in there where the firing pin rides, you'll get some buildup in there, and then I can run it down that channel where the uh, ejector lever runs and work all that gunk out of there. You can see the carbon that came off of that run through it. Okay. And then I can try and get around the bolt face. The key on the bolt face again is, are these areas where you see the buildup around the edge where the actual casing rim will sit and then underneath that lip of the extractor. Okay, so I'll obviously do a little bit more work here on this to clean that up, um, but a good first start. Now, function check. Once I'm done with this, I'll kind of shake it back and forth and I wanna make sure that the rollers are moving freely in and out. And then if I put my thumb on the front of the bolt face, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press up against the extractor right here. And I should not be able to move it freely. I mean, it should take an extreme amount of force and pressure from my thumb to make this extractor move up and down. 
if instead you press on this and it feels really easy to move it, or you can actually like feel it wobbling around, well then your extractor spring itself needs to be replaced. Um, the extractor springs on the roller delayed guns are kind of the weak link of the system. And if over thousands of rounds are being used, or if they get really torqued out of position in a malfunction, um, it can bend the spring to a point where it no longer has the rebound pressure needed. This is a good function test. Uh, so that's why it's good to have spares of these in your range bag or in your at your workbench. Um, but I'm not going to remove this for normal maintenance. If I shot a whole lot and I wanted to do a more detailed cleaning, or if I had to replace the extractor spring itself, well, then what I would do is I would find some sort of um, pointed tool. You reach in there on the tip and you pull up and turn it to the side and then force it out. Uh, and that would allow first the extractor spring to be removed and then your extractor itself. And what that'll give you is now um, the availability to reach in here with a dental pick and get into these deeper areas that obviously will be very filthy as well, but are currently covered by the extractor and the extractor spring. The key to think about with this though is the Extractor spring is a one-time use only item. So if you remove it, either for cleaning or to replace it, you have to have a spare to put back in again. The force that's required to take it out and put it back in is enough that H&K recommends you, you never reuse those springs. So there's your, uh, there's your cleaning process, your inspection process for that. On the bolt carrier itself, you just wipe it down. You're going to find some buildup here and on the front side above where the bolt is. You can get inside uh, this area here with a Q-tip and clean that out as well. But once you're done, everything's been wiped down, you're happy with it, what you're going to do is first do your inspection on your bolt with your locking piece. If you look at the locking piece, you'll see on one side it's smooth. This is the standard locking piece. Um, it has no markings whatsoever. If I look at this one out of the MP5SD and I rotate it over, you'll actually see it says MP5SD. Um, so different locking pieces for different weapons, the difference being the shoulder of the locking piece, how steep um, or flat this angle is will be dependent on the model weapon it, it runs on. And this helps with the timing related to how quickly it goes um, in and out of battery. Um, so you have to have the right locking piece. This is also why it's really crucial if you're cleaning a bunch of different MP5 series guns on a table that you don't mix parts in um, and mix those things up. But in this case, again, to test it, what you'll notice it's flush on one side. On the other side, you'll notice there's this little recessed trough right there, okay? And if you look at the bolt, you'll see there's a roll pin at the top. That roll pin holds the roller retainer plate, which holds the rollers in place. And it actually extends inside the bolt carrier itself. You probably can't see it because of the lighting, but it actually sticks down. And it sticks down to correspond with this trough. So. Um, if I try to put this, this locking piece in with the, the flush side up, it won't fit at all. It, it stops on this roll pin. But if I put it in with the trough there, you can see now what I'm looking for is that it moves freely in and out and it's moving those rollers in and out. So now I'm good to go there. To reassemble, get your firing pin, your firing pin spring, and then put those right through your um, locking piece. And then if you'll notice the locking piece is rounded on these three sides, but here at, at this point, there's kind of a triangular raised portion. And then if you look at the inside of the, the bolt carrier itself, it's rounded on three sides. The bottom, it drops down, kind of this oval shape. Well, those correspond. So I'm going to take this triangular side. I'm going to insert it in, holding it in my right hand, and I'm going to push against the spring tension of the uh, firing pin spring. And then I'm going to rotate the locking piece towards me, just a, uh, like a half uh, a quarter turn, so not completely horizontal, um, but kind of a, a quarter turn. Again, you can see the trough is facing up. And again, with the bolt carrier in my right hand facing forward, I'll then take the bolt facing up, slide it right over top of the locking piece, and then I'm going to turn it away from me. You'll feel it click, and then your test is that it can move freely with the rollers moving in and out. At that point, if I had removed the recoil uh, spring assembly, I would drop it back in place. Now you're ready to go. Light coat of lubrication on all the parts. Uh, you're set there. Same thing with this process with the MP5 SD. Rotate it just a quarter. Drop the bolt on. Check to make sure it rotates back and forth. You can set that one aside. Okay, so on to the receivers. Okay, again, my tip here. 
What I see all the time is guys who take the receiver and they immediately grab their, their spray bottle and they just start dousing it with um, solvent and getting in there. I would resist the temptation to do that and instead come through with some kind of rag or dry cloth and just wipe down as much as you can in all those areas, getting as deep into it as possible, even inside the chamber area, and you'll be surprised with how much you're gonna get out of the weapon first, okay? Once that's done, then again, before dousing it up, you want to focus on aggressively breaking up the carbon that's gonna cauterize inside. And the area I'm talking about is this area of the chamber face and the barrel extension, basically everything forward of the ejection port, this area right here. That's where you know the explosion of the cartridge is happening. That's where the most fouling is going to occur. Sure, you're gonna have carbon everywhere else inside the receiver, but that's where it's most likely occur. And um, depending on how much you fire between cleaning will depend on how nasty that is. If you fire suppressed, and definitely if you fire full auto where there's more rounds coming faster, the heat transfer that goes on in there is actually going to, instead of just create a layer of, of fouling that we can wipe off, it's gonna cauterize these little chunks of carbon inside there and they're gonna fuse to the metal and they're, you're not gonna be able to just go in there with your finger in a little rag like this and wipe it off. You're gonna have to get more aggressive and break that stuff up. So it's really hard to show you on camera. So what I'm gonna focus on here instead is, is my cutaway example training model. So what I'm talking about is this area here. This is the barrel extension. You can see the, the recessed um, cutouts here. This is where the rollers fit in. And then obviously the bolt face is going to be right up there in the front. If you look here as well, you're going to see there's, there's kind of this trough that goes all the way around the actual chamber there as well. And you're going to get all this hard carbon that's going to build up on all those areas around there. And the only way to get in there is to, to get something that's strong and create friction in order to break that up. So how do we do that? Well, that's where this handy dandy HK cleaning kit comes in handy. And what you'll notice when you look in there is there's this little tool right here. This is called the HK chamber face brush. It works for all of your um, uh, roller delayed weapons. And you're going to see it's just stainless steel bristles, very sharp, long and you'll see it also has the HK logo on here. So obviously this is probably $50 just because it's got an HK logo on there, okay? Um, I'm sure there is another uh, industry example of this somewhere else that, that somebody has a tool like this that you could find that's less expensive. Um, what I like about this is it's designed to fit onto the end of the cleaning um, rods for this. So you might find something else um, that could be a similar product but you might not be able to get it to fit where it'll work inside the receiver. So how does that work? You just attach it to the end of a cleaning rod and it's designed to fit inside the receiver, go all the way up to the, to the chamber, and then through use of turning it, it will cause friction and break up that. And what I like to do is come in straight, work on the chamber face itself, and then try and get as much of an angle as I can within the receiver to get into the side walls of, uh, of the barrel extension. But even with hand strength alone, you'll realize that a lot of times I'm not able to get all of that stuff off. So what do you do then? Well, you bring in a little extra tool, get yourself your power tool, attach your cleaning rod to the end of the power tool. And now I've got additional torque uh, available to clean into the chamber area and the barrel extension. So highly recommend if you're running an MP5 series gun or in the roller delays, especially if you're shooting a lot of suppressed and full auto where that carbon's going to cauterize, you got to have a tool like this. You want to be able to attach it to a cleaning rod, and you're probably going to want to get some kind of a power drill to help you with that. Once you do this, again, if you haven't already applied solvent, when you tip it upside down, you're going to see all this powder come out. If you put all the solvent in there, all it's gonna do is shoot this crap all over you and everything else that's within range. So that's why you wanna do it dry. After that, even as great as that is, you're still gonna to have to come in with a dental pick, either through the magazine well, through the ejection port, coming in a different angle, and really scraping off all of these areas uh, along, the, uh, along the chamber uh, face and that little trough I showed you and along the barrel extension area to break it all up. When you're done, it should look awesome. And I don't know how well I can show this to you. 
I should have done a before and after, um, but the uh, this area inside the chamber and inside um, the barrel extension, I mean, it, it was just caked on with built-in uh, carbon and it took quite a bit of time and effort to, uh, to get all that clean. Um, once all that's been done and you think you've broken it up, that's when I would recommend coming in with the solvent and, uh, and working it through there to try and get as much as you can. We'll do a run and see how much is in here from just zero in the weapon. Um, shouldn't be a whole lot, but again, this is just me wiping through with my finger. You can see pretty dirty, um, but not that bad. And I'm not feeling any kind of uh, cauterized carbon in there. If you did, it would feel bumpy and abrasive instead of smooth um, like this does. Okay, but I would run similar things all on these rails, everywhere that I can touch, try and get it clean. This, this rail, you can see the recess section here where the stock forks fit in there. That rail is where uh, the bolt carrier rides back and forth. So you wanna make sure you get all the crap that's out along the edges of that as well. That'll help smooth it all out. And again, you can blow the rest of it out, compressed air. You'll also notice this area here inside the magazine well where the magazine release, both the paddle and the push button uh, manipulate. There's a spring in there with, with a, a little camming action and an axle that goes across. You can get a lot of carbon buildup there, so you want to get in there and scrape that out. Um, you want to get in there with Q-tips and compressed air and blow that out and make sure it's nice and smooth um, action. And then the rest of the weapon, you're going to put um, a clean patch and light coat of your solvent all the way across wiping off anything that, that's excessive um, on there. Make sure you pay attention to your uh, rear sight drum. Make sure you get inside your front sight as well. I'll wipe down all these. Um, if you've got the thread protector, you'll want to remove the thread protector, clean the inside of it with, with Q-tip, clean the threads as well, put those back on. And then with the charging handle, you want to do the best you can coming in with uh, Q-tips and kind of clean inside there, clean along the uh the cocking tube support as best you can with some light lubrication keep it running smoothly and then you, at that point you can come in with your standard cleaning rod so you can see i've got the eyelet attached to the cleaning rod now if i wanted to uh before i put that through what i'm going to do is i'm going to run um, the actual uh, bore brush through you always start from the rear go to the front when you get the front remove the tool and then retract the, the rod out of the back. You don't want to go forward and then pull it back out again. You're going against the direction of the bullet. You can do damage to the, the crown of the, of the barrel. So always through from the rear, remove the tool. You'll also notice um, that before I go to my eyelet, I have one more tool here. This looks very much like your standard um, brush, but the bristles are a little um, longer in diameter. You'll notice there's this metal end cap, and you'll also notice there's kind of this washer stop plate here at the back. This is actually designed to clean the barrel flutes um, that are in the chamber area, and this um, washer here is to stop it from protruding any further forward and doing any damage to the rifle that's further on. So again, let me use my training example and show you what I'm talking about. If you look here, you'll see um, here's the chamber, here's your barrel, standard rifling, uh, polygonal rifling there, but you'll see these longitudinal flutes right here. They go all the way around the barrel in the chamber area, and what these are designed to do is to aid in the extraction and ejection of the fired cartridge. So normally with a barrel that doesn't have flutes, all that gas pressure that's coming back into the weapon is going inside that empty casing, and it's causing the casing to swell out and that's why you have to have a really strong and powerful extractor in order to get those casings out. Well, by using these uh, longitudinal flutes all the way around, that gas that goes back, some of it goes inside the casing. The rest forms this thin layer of gas on the outside of the casing, equalizes the pressure, and it literally floats the casing out of um, the chamber, reducing the need for a really powerful extractor. Um, so um, you obviously want to make sure that these flutes don't clog up with gunk too. By inserting this in here, you'll notice it only goes far enough to meet where the flutes are, then it stops with, with, the, uh, with this little washer stop plate. You can turn it around, clean the flutes out, bring it back. So it's another great uh, tool that is in your, uh, your kit. 
and that I highly recommend having and using with the roller blade guns. Um, so once I've done that, then I can put the eyelet on and then I can run it with patches on it uh, through the barrel again to the front, pull the patches out, pull the rod back out, run that until those patches are clean. Okay, so that's your uh, cleaning the barrel process. Um, and once you've done all that, you're satisfied that you've gotten uh, as much of the carbon out as you can. You've wiped the gun down. Everything's got a light coat of, of solvent. Um, you can move on. Now I will showcase another thing here for you. And this is the MP5 SD. Okay. So let me grab one thing real quick. Okay. So MP5 SD, a little bit different because um, it has a different style of handguard. It's got a suppressor on the end of it. Um, so we have to put a little bit more focus on that. The first thing you're going to want to do is remove the suppressor. It's always key that every time you shoot the MP5 SD that you remove the suppressor, you clean the barrel correctly, um, because if you don't, you can actually seize this. We've seen it so many times, a lot of times with law enforcement organizations that no longer have the qualified armorers and operators to understand these weapons. They just shoot them, shoot them, shoot them and don't realize that they're, they're locking up the weapon. So you'll unscrew your suppressor until it's off the threads, and then it'll come off. These, these suppressors, the majority of them, especially the HK ones, are sealed. There's no way to take them apart and clean them separately. So just set that off the side. Um, I guess the recommendation how to get the carbon out of them is find some kind of wooden table or something. You can tap the... Uh, the suppressor against and try and loosen up as much as you can try to get some some guys will use ultrasonic cleaners or something but there's no way to take this apart and clean it. okay when you get to the actual um, hand guard what you want to do is get yourself some sort of flathead screwdriver like this i recommend you put um some uh, some tape over the edge of it to keep it from scratching the metal finish on there like i am here and then you'll see that there's this point here and another one there um, that work against uh, the barrel shroud that's underneath it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the screwdriver, I'm going to fit it there, and I'm going to kind of pry it up. And once I pry it up and I get my hands on there, now I can kind of slide the handguard over the front of the, uh, the barrel shroud. And actually, I got enough force on here. It's a little bit difficult to do in the seated position I'm in, but there we go. So your handguard comes off. What you'll notice is it's got an aluminum heat shield on the, on the inside, rubber on the outside. This interior portion is gonna be filthy, so you'll wanna clean all that out with a rag. You can set it off the side. It's filthy because you're gonna see that there are openings here in the barrel shroud that will allow the fouling to get out and on there, okay? If you've never seen an MP5 SD before, what you'll notice is the barrel itself ends, probably a little better show you here, the barrel itself ends right here. It does not stick out further than the weapon. It's, a, it's shorter than that. And hopefully you can see this, there's barrel ports all the way around the barrel in this position um, that work that way. So um, don't wanna get too deep into the MP5 SD, but the way it, it works in combination with the barrel and the suppressor system is there's two different sections to the suppressor itself. So you have a normal, uh, I guess, more traditional baffle design like we would see with, with most other suppressors, but at the rear, you actually have an open expansion chamber. So two things are happening here. In that expansion chamber, um, part of the gas from the fired round is diverted through those ports in that chamber. That lowers the, uh, the, the uh, heat uh, associated with that cartridge and then the rest of the gas that comes out at the end of the barrel here goes through the baffles and that lowers the sound uh, signature as well. So the two things combined will allow you to shoot supersonic ammo, but get subsonic uh, optimized performance because you get a lower heat signature um, and, um, and lowering uh, the sound signature, the velocity of the round, both at the same time. Anyway, the challenge of this is how do I get in here to clean this barrel? Um, because with those ports open and the gas that's diverted through there, you'll get a lot of carbon buildup on the barrel. I don't know, know how much you can see, but there's little bits here that are, that are still on the barrel. Um, you'll get it on the threading. You'll get it on, on the back here um, <clears throat> where, the, uh, where the suppressor seats up against the, uh, 
the trunnion area. So lots of stuff you got to get in there and clean. So you need a special tool and that's what this is. So H&K makes this, this is called the MP5SD um, brush. You'll notice it's got really sharp uh, stainless steel bristles just like we did on your, uh, your chamber face tool. Um, you'll see a knurled section, you'll see a thread pattern. So the way this is actually designed to work is to fit within the thread pattern of the suppressor itself. So it screws onto the rear of the suppressor. And then once it's in position, you will actually take the tool using the suppressor as the handle, you'll put it over the barrel and then rotate it around um, in circular motion all the way down to the base and then pull it back off again. And what that, that's gonna do is it's gonna break up all the carbon that's around the barrel and down here on the threads. And when you turn it upside down, you'll see a bunch of carbon come out on the table. You'll do that several times. That's gonna allow you to maintain that carbon. If you don't have this tool and you don't do that, you're gonna get so much carbon on the barrel that you won't be, if you can get the suppressor off, you won't be able to get the suppressor back on over the barrel. It'll be too, the, the diameter will be too wide or the threads will be too rough. And then you wanna get inside here, if you have to with a dental pick, scrape off any hard carbon that's inside there, wipe it down with a cloth, um, get that set up so you can work around that. And then from the rest of the time, you're just doing the best you can, get in there with a dental pick, get in there with Q-tips to get as much of that carbon out as possible. And hopefully you're, you're doing this with a new gun, you're doing this every time you shoot it, it'll never get as bad as this one's gotten. So I got a little bit more work to do on this one uh, before I finish it up, but uh, absolutely crucial that you, uh, you clean that portion both the suppressor, the barrel, and you have the barrel tool um, from h &K. Okay, so receiver's done. Now let's talk about um, going to the trigger groups, okay? For the trigger groups, got different types. Oh, God. Grab this one. Okay, so the original style trigger, trigger group what we call the SEF, okay, S, E, and F, um, because of the, the markings on there, this is the first letter of the German word for safe, semi, and fully automatic. These were um, a left side only selector, you can see selectors on this side, it's not on the right side, and they had this little thumb rest on there, so easily identifiable for that standpoint. <clears throat> You've also seen some of them that do not have the thumb rest on there, they're smooth on the other side, but still are only a left side selector. So. Broken down, most people would just clean it just like this. They do the best they could to get in here with Q-tips and maybe compressed air um, and work at it. If you wanted to get a little bit more access to it, uh, you would remove the trigger pack from the trigger housing. And the first thing you would do with that is put it on fire and put your thumb here to prevent it from slamming into the metal here. I would just release the hammer forward, okay? At that point, to remove it from the housing on an SEF um, trigger group, I would rotate the selector up to the 12 o'clock position, and that allows it to come straight out of the weapon, pulling from left to right. At that point, you just grab the, the hammer with one hand, pull up on the hammer, pull down on the, on the housing, and it'll separate itself. You'll get all kinds of crap inside here that you can get in there with a rag, compressed air, whatever, blow that out. And then this is as far as you will want to disassemble this. Anything further than that is really armor level maintenance, but you're gonna do the best you can to wipe all this down, get in there with Q-tips, um, work around these areas to clean as much of it out. And again, light coat of lubrication on there. The more lubrication you get, the more dirt and debris is gonna be attracted to it. So depending on your environmental conditions, whether you're in uh, a humid environment, like maybe Miami versus a, a desert environment like Scottsdale, Arizona, would be dependent on how much, uh, how much you're gonna put on there. Once you're done cleaning that, I'm gonna go ahead and line it back in the housing, set it back up. Sometimes you have to pry the housing out a little bit in order to, to get it seat. You're pushing down and as far forward as possible. And you'll kind of feel it click into place and you'll look through the side and look for that alignment. Once it's in place, then I'm simply gonna reinsert my selector from left to right at the 12 o'clock position and then rotate it back down to safe. Okay, at this point I do a function check, but I'll show you how to do that on the full auto guns. Um, uh, next okay so we'll set that aside now if i have 
what we call the single fire or the FBI style that comes with uh, the uh, SP5 series guns. Or if I have a full auto Navy, uh, safe semi full, or I have a burst trigger group, you know, any combination of a two or a three round burst function with or without full auto, these are ambidextrous in nature. So there's a selector on either side and they all disassemble in the same way. So the first thing again, you're gonna do, put your thumb over the top, put it on fire, ease it forward. And then what I want you to focus on here is there is this kind of dog leg um, lever coming from the left side, just to the right of where the ejector lever is and starting to come over top of where the hammer spring is, okay? That is your takedown lever. So you have to depress that in order to rotate your selectors left and right side to, uh, to remove them from the weapon system. So regardless of which one of these you have, if they are ambidextrous like this, they're the same. So I would press down on that lever with this thumb. And as I'm pressing down with that, I will rotate it past semi, uh, past safe to semi and keep going up like I'm going to uh, full auto, past the 12 o'clock to what I call the five o'clock somewhere position. Once I get down here, you'll feel it kind of stop, and then I can pull one side out, and the right side will fall out the other way, okay? Then I'm just gonna grab onto the hammer with one hand, just like I did before, pulling down with this hand, pulling up with this hand, and it'll pull right out. Again, clean out with a rag, compressed air, get that as much as you can. Wipe these down as much as you can. Um, Relubricate where needed, and then you're going to reinsert. You'll notice this one's pretty tight pull it slightly, get it back, and push down and forward till you feel it in position. Sometimes you have to push a little bit forward, line everything up again. Now again, if you look really closely, hopefully you can see this little shark tooth right here. That shark tooth, now watch when I push down on the takedown lever, you'll notice that shark tooth goes away. That, that is what's maintaining this left side selector and preventing it from coming out. So when I go to put it back in again, I'm going to insert this at, again, the five o'clock somewhere position while pushing down on the takedown lever with my left hand, insert it in, five o'clock somewhere, then I'm gonna rotate over, putting my thumb on it, pressing it all the way up against it, then take the right side selector, put it in place, and then I'm going to rotate clockwise back up. If I feel any resistance right here, which is what I feel now, stop. Don't go any further forward. Resist the temptation to force it like we all want to and back it off. What has happened is there's some kind of misalignment, usually very, very slight, either with the trigger pack inside the housing or the selectors. And if I continue to rotate through, this um, detent here will actually dig into the metal of the housing. It'll create a burr or like a speed bump and you won't be able to move past it. And if you do, you'll actually deform it, lock it in. So be careful. I've got a separate video on how to recognize that, how to correct it. You can look at that on my channel. Um, but the process, again, what I'm trying to focus on is the five o'clock somewhere position, thumb down, come across here with the other finger, start to rotate it. Don't, if you're feeling resistance, stop. If not, keep rotating past um, 12 o'clock in counterclockwise motion, and then go on to safe, or I'm sorry, semi and then safe. Okay, function check. I'll do that with a burst trigger group. Um, Works with all of them. You always want to check this. You can do it either with the trigger group alone or when it gets back on the weapon. Uh, first thing you'll do, pull the hammer back to the rear. On the full auto guns, they have a uh, two different intercept notches on the hammer. So you hopefully heard that. You'll see it when we do it again. It clicks twice. Where on a semi-automatic gun, there's only one intercept notch. So it only clicks once. You'll see how much higher the hammer is right now on the semi-auto gun. The other one right now, it's tucked in behind the ejector can't see it, that's because right now it's being held by the second intercept notch, which is on the full auto trip lever um, and the full auto sear, okay? With the weapon on safe, I'm gonna pull the trigger. It should not release the hammer. Then I'm gonna put the weapon on um, fire, semi-automatic, and on a full auto gun, I have to depress this um, auto trip lever on the standard gun, it's not there, so when I Pull the trigger here, just put my, my finger here in front, keep it from slamming up against the metal. Pull the trigger, it should release the hammer, okay? In this case, I have to depress the auto trip lever, that releases the hammer to the semi-automatic setting, which you have here, and then when I pull the trigger, it'll release the hammer forward, okay? So that tells me the semi-automatic's working. Now, if I had burst fire, I'd go to the burst setting, okay? Rotate it up one more to burst. 
because this is two round, I'm looking for two round bursts. So I'm gonna cock it all the way back. I'm gonna release it to uh, the semi-automatic setting. Now I'm gonna pull the trigger and it's gonna fly forward. I'm gonna hold the trigger back to the rear, simulating them in burst. I'm going to recock it again, holding the trigger back to the rear, depress it again. You should see the hammer fall all the way forward. It doesn't go to that second intercept notch and stop. It goes forward because I'm firing a second now shot. Now holding the trigger back to the rear still, I'm gonna cock it a third time and hit the auto trip lever and you see it, it went back to its hold position on the auto catch because it's a two round burst function. It fired two rounds and then the counting wheel inside reset. If this was a three round burst, I would test it one more time for that third set. Okay, now I can release and then I can go to the full auto setting and on the full auto setting, when I pull the trigger, it should fly forward. I'll recock it, holding the trigger back to the rear and every time, I hit this release lever, the uh, the hammer should fly forward because it's gonna run full auto until I either let go of the trigger or it runs out of ammo. So that tells me that I've done a full function check on my trigger group. Then I would reassemble the weapon um, and test all that functionality uh, one more time. Okay, so with that said, let me show you how to put it all back together again. Okay, we'll use uh, the MP5SD as the example here. Okay, I'm gonna assemble the handguard, open it up, slide it over top. Okay, handguard goes on, suppressor, rotate it on until it locks. Tighten it down, okay. Then I'm going to take my bolt group, which is this one over here. I'm going to slide it down into the receiver. Then I'm going to take my trigger group. I'll go ahead and cock the hammer back um, so that it'll seat easier. Slide it in position. Because this is a full auto trigger group, I have a, a, a push pin that I need to reinsert uh, down there at the bottom. Question a lot of times, should I go left to right or right to left? For me, because there's a push button mag release on this side, some guys actually use that. I would not want to confuse it with the push pin and accidentally push the push pin out of the way. So if I inserted it from this way, I could end up pushing the pin. So I'll actually insert it so that it closes from right to left. So pushing this actually does no movement whatsoever. That's set and then I can get the stock, slide the stock on. Hold it down, doesn't matter left or right on the rear push pin. Okay, I actually used the wrong push pin. It's also good why you don't want to um, mix up parts. That's the push pin for my front hand guard for my SP5. That's the correct push pin. Okay, and at that point, I could do again a full function check on the weapon like I just showed you um, to make sure that everything works correctly on the weapon system. So that is cleaning a, uh, an MP5 series weapon for, again, normal um, maintenance cleaning on your weapon, not a detail cleaning. If you need a detail cleaning, now you're talking about opera operator level maintenance. That's where you need to come to an armor course and, uh, and learn how that works. Um, or you know, if you don't wanna do that, then you contact somebody like me and send your send your weapon out to me and I'll, I'll do the work for you. Um, but normal maintenance like that, after every time you shoot, is going to allow you to um, you know, have really kind of trouble-free operation uh, with your weapons. Okay. On the SP5, same thing, slide into position. There's no front push pin on this, so you just have to hold everything in place and line this up. And I found that the uh, these newer stocks and the SP5s, they are really, really tight fit, which is good. You want a good tight tolerance. You just have to put a little bit more uh, force into setting these up. And again, I'll do a function check to make sure that everything's working as it should. Okay, so that's cleaning those. The last thing I'll talk about is one that's, that's usually kind of overlooked um, from 
a maintenance inspection, and that's your magazines. So, how do I know this? Because I clean a lot of guns, and a lot of times people will send me their weapons with the magazine. So I'll disassemble the magazine, and you will be surprised at the disgustingness I find inside. Uh, you know, rocks and all kinds of debris that'll fall out, and just massive amounts of carbon inside. And a lot of guys. They, if they have a problem with their gun, they're thinking about the gun. They don't think about the magazine themselves. These magazines are designed to be, um, you know, disposable. They're not meant to, to live the same life cycle as the weapon, even though, you know, with these, they're, they're really expensive. Um, you need to think of them as such. We don't normally drop our weapons on the ground, but a lot of times I see people dropping magazines on the ground. Um, and then there's just the wear that's associated with the springs themselves. So what I will do here is show you how to disassemble the MP5 series guns. It's a little bit more challenging with these than some newer ones. You're going to notice on the base plate, there's a smaller section here where um, I have to push against a, um, uh, an internal plate that puts pressure against the base plate itself under the spring tension of the magazine spring. And then you'll notice you've got this detent here and this detent there. So again, if you want to, you can put some, uh, some tape around there. But what you have to do is use something flat like this to press in against the uh, this detent, so you're going to end up scratching it a little bit. Um, so just be aware that there's your, your mag's no longer going to be a perfect look like it was before. Okay, and if this has never been done before, which most of them ha haven't, um, you will notice that this can be a little more challenged. Once you've done this a few times, um, it gets easier. So you see, I can pop that section off. Then I'm going to pop this section off. Make sure you're pointing in a safe direction when you do this because it is under spring tension. Okay, and once I've got both those sections lifted, a little bit of back and forth allows me to pry off these. Okay, then I can get inside. So you probably can't see this, but inside this is really filthy. So what I'd have to do at that point is get in there and clean out with that. Some guys will use an AP brush. I've got a, uh, a shorter length um, rod and I attach on um, a shotgun uh, style uh, cleaning patch uh, kind of pad and run that in there. I can get in there with some other tools, but you want to clean this out as much as possible. The areas you're really going to want to focus on are right here up around the feed lips. That's where the most of the carbon buildup will be. And then you want to look at the feed lips, make sure there's no cracks. You don't see any deformation where one seems to be bent more than the other side. Obviously, you're going to clean the top here on the follow. There'll be a, a lot of times there'll be a lot of carbon there as well. And clean the the uh, spring itself. Clean down here. Wipe off any rust that might be there. And then what I do is I'll actually take the uh, the spring out. I'll lay it down on the table, and then I will go to my drawer where I have all my extra springs, and I'll lay down a new MP5 spring out of the bag next to it. And if I notice a significant difference in length. Then I'll go, okay, well, then this one's just doesn't have the resistance. It's been compressed for too long or compressed too many times. And if I can notice that difference in length, I'll take this, throw it in the trash can, put the new one on there and go. Um, it's obviously much more cost effective to replace just the spring than to buy the entire magazine. So when you can find the extra springs for whatever weapon you have, stock up on those. Um, like everything else, you will find that at some point, Whatever manufacturer it is, whether it's a car manufacturer, gun manufacturer, at some point they're going to stop supporting that line of weapons. The springs are the things on all the guns that usually wear out the first. So if you can find springs, magazine springs, extractor springs, trigger return springs, things like that, those are the parts you should stock up on um, and have. But once you've decided whether or not you need to change your magazine spring out, uh, then you're going to put it all back together again. Okay, well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. As always, I am humbled to share my knowledge and experience with you. If you're in need of H&K service and support, like what you just saw here today, um, or you need training opportunities, give me a shout. That's what I'm here for. Thanks, guys.